Polymers are the base material for plastics. Plastics, therefore, are compounds of polymers and additives. A polymer is a substance composed of many, many molecules that are covalently bonded together to form one large molecule, like I just explained, that of the tannin of a high molecular mass. A monomer is therefore the single part of the large molecule called polymer. The first part of the word polymer comes from the Greek poly, meaning many, and a polymer is therefore many parts. It is a collection of repeated parts in a single chain. I work with three polymers, as the vice chancellor read out in the brief. The first one is polystyrene. This is the chemical structure of polystyrene. They will identify polystyrene more in its applications. For example, the expanded polystyrene packaging in the yogurt container, in the CD and DVD cases, and then in the food home pack that we normally take home. These, all these are made up of polystyrene. The next polymer I studied was polyphenylene sulfide. This is the unit of polyphenylene sulfide with the linear structure of polyphenylene, and the applications are there. Air filter bag materials, all of us in our homes that have a pump and we have filter, these materials are made up of polyphenylene sulfide. Or in our cars, PPS is used in high performance tubes. When I get to PPS, I will tell you more of the, more of the properties. Polyvinyl chloride. We all know PVC, we've heard of it many times, and we are used as pipes. And indeed, a range of cosmetics and food containers. Why do they fail? Failure is a, practical polymer, is a practical problem in polymer usage and implies that the plastic is no longer fit for a specific purpose. In almost all cases, the ability to withstand and mechanical stress or strain is the most important criterion in the service of the plastic, though shrinkage or appearance is fast becoming a first indication of loss of serviceability. And I've listed here the type of failure and the indicators. For my purpose, we are going to concentrate on thermal and chemical. Despite these different modes, the generic systematic description of failures in all cases started above is degradation of the intrinsic composition of the polymer product. That is, plastics become unusable when they degrade, and sometimes in such manner as to be very harmful or dangerous to human beings. This is so especially when they catch fire because of the fumes they produce may be poisonous. The study of the degradation of polymers could therefore reveal the weak link in a polymeric structure that renders them not fit for the purpose. An example is what I've just shown there, and I said you should note the discoloration, swollen dimensions, and tiny splits running through the material of the picture that I've just shown. Polymer degradation studies. In studying the degradation of polymers, the chemist looks for the weak link because this will be the first part of the polymer chain to be broken before others. It will also be the point of amelioration, very important if this were to be attempted. Polymer degradation actually is a change in the properties, tensile strength, color, change of a polymer or polymer-based product under the influence of one or more environmental factors such as heat, light, or chemicals. When polymer degrades, the first indication is a sudden loss of molecular weight which are only detected by spectroscopic means. It is after this has happened that other evidential proofs, such as change in color, loss in strength, formation of fumes, etc., etc., become evident. There are many methods of studying thermal degradation of polymers or materials generally. Some are destructive, whereas others are non-destructive. One of the approaches I used in my next few discussions is the locally designed apparatus called molecular steel. It is a destructive test. By its name, the molecular steel is a thermal degrading apparatus that allows for collection of products of degradation using temperature differentials along its horizontal path with the aid of a vacuum pump, which serves to prevent interference of oxygen on the degrading melt whilst helping to evacuate the vapors of the degrading mass. And what I have here is a massive constructed using all glass except the furnace. Uh, this is the furnace that I put on the right side, upper right side. And the important thing here is you should note the furnace and then the diagram below it, where I have A, B, C, D. What it means is that after every particular experiment, we are going to have seven products from which we can analyze. A, 
B, C, D. There's going to be a residue. That's five. And then if you look at the diagram, you will see T1 and T2. These are also traps to collect pyrolysis products. So the first studies, polystyrene. The degradation of PS was the subject of many studies over many years. And although the, kinet the main kinetic and mechanistic features are reasonably well understood, the interpretation of the degradation was, however, less unanimous and was the subject of controversy among many of the workers. Although PS degrades completely to the monomer in a carefully programmed heating regime, the manner of its degradation was observed to involve an initial sudden decrease in the molar mass, which was ascribed to weaklings in the PS structure. What could cause this sudden decrease became a subject of intense research of the structure of polystyrene. To answer this question thus became my first contribution to the debate, another source of the title for this inaugural lecture. It turned out that the more research carried out on PS, the more elusive identifying the weak link. Indeed, at one time, it was even thought that the type of initiator used to prepare the polystyrene would be the culprit. But the existence of the phenomenon is not much in doubt. Workers, however, have to settle on two sources, either the manner PS was prepared or through the nature of the molecule used to terminate the polymerization reaction are the culprits in the mechanistic pathway of PS degradation. In my first article on the subject, I confirmed the two features mentioned above. In the article, I reported the degradation of a low molar mass polystyrene, where I observed the sudden decrease in molar mass while undergoing degradation, but evidenced by no visible production of products of degradation until much later when visible products were obtained. Thereafter, the product of this initial degradation was now further degraded under an assumption that products of the initial degradation are still polymeric in nature. This time around, we did not now observe the sudden loss of the molecular weight, indicating that whatever caused the initial sudden decrease was no longer present in the structure. The link to the reference is put there. I was able to conclude, like other workers, that a bond which constituted the weak link must have caused the initial degradation. And other processes that followed are the normal degradative reactions of polystyrene. And this is the kind of suspects that we have as causing the weak link. Uh, I will not bore you much with this, except to see we could have head to head, we could have unsaturation, we could have auto and paraconal resonance terms, we could have peroxide linkages. After polystyrene, I went into polyphenylene sulfide. PPS is an organic polymer consisting of aromatic rings linked with sulfides. At the time of this research work, the commercial brand we use is known as writing. PPS offers a unique combination of properties. It has low water absorption and is insoluble in all common solvents below 200 degrees centigrade, therefore making PPS stable in both st typical and alternative automotive fuels. Its other properties are as listed. Excellent hydrolytic stability, inherently self-extinguishing, that is, if it burns, it, it kills itself and extinguishes the fire. Precision molding to tight tolerances with high producibility, high stress cracking resistance, long-term and short-term thermal stability, high modulus and creep resistance, and dimensional stability. The main work on polyphenylene sulfide is predicated on its thermal stability at temperatures of up to 450 degrees centigrade. Previous studies on PPS by other workers have indicated, however, that the commercial brand of PPS is only thermally stable at ordinary temperatures up to 250. My task, therefore, was to investigate why this is so. Would there be a weak link in an otherwise solid structure? First, we turn again to molecular steel and I degraded a series of commercial samples and confirmed that the sample degrades at much lower temperature than predicted. The reference is as stated. In an attempt to characterize the polyphenylene sulfide, I discovered that a part of the PPS went into solution, about 2.8%, very small, but enough to cause the harm, the havoc we are looking for, and a part did not go into solution. Mass spectrometer indicated that the solvent soluble part to be of a lower molar mass sample. This we call toluene soluble 
PPS. We concluded that when PPS is prepared via the Phillips method, there exists a low molar mass constituent as a component of the whole. I then subjected the two components to thermal degradation. And we discovered that the two components had two different onset temp temperatures of degradation. And so also, in a wide range of publications, I provided the false detailed insight into the vacuum thermal degradation of low PPS and high PPS, respectively, and the products of their degradation, showing in the process the structural differences between the high molar mass and the low molar mass components. The references are also as stated. Further investigation using elemental analysis now gave insight that TSPPS must be the weak link that triggers the commencement of degradation of the larger PPS at temperatures lower than expected. Structural elucidation indicates that the weak link is a result of the different bond types in the molecule. We confirmed that whereas the weakest bond and hence the weakest link in the high PPS polymer is the carbon sulfur bond, that of the low PPS, referring to as TSPPS, had sulfur sulfur bond as weakest link. The sulfur sulfur bond, as we can see later, is weaker than the carbon sulfur bond and will therefore break first in the same environment. And this is the structure that I've given you. The upper one is the normal for the phenylene sulfide. The lower one is the smaller, uh, the uh, low molecular one with the SS structure. The reference is also as given. And these are the various uh, products given when you degrade uh, polyphenylene sulfide. And the reasons for the weakness is what I've just said. These are the bond strength. You can see carbon to carbon is 347. That is the bond that is mostly or most, most chemicals. Uh, and then you can see 00148. You can see uh, phenyl H113 and thereabout and thereabout. Reasons for weak links. In polymeric systems, like all chemical systems, the status of the molecular structure is guided by the relative strength of the bond types constituent in the structure. The PSS essentially is CH, CC, and C double bonds bond in its structure, none of which is an outright candidate for a weak link. Further investigation revealed that the PS degrades from its chain ends, and the nature of the chain end determines the occurrence of the weak link. This explains why the low molar mass PS was degraded, there was no sudden loss in molecular weight because this had already degraded when the high molar mass was initially degraded. The PPS in the, on its own has CC, carbon-carbon, carbon-hydrogen, carbon-sulfur, sulfur-sulfur bonds in the structure. By bond strength, the weakest is the sulfur-sulfur bond followed by the carbon-sulfur. And this is exactly what you observe in my studies. Stabilization of weak links. In every system, once the weak link has been identified, the next step is to ameliorate this unwanted effort by stabilizing the link. In a polymer system, the major indication of a polymer failure during use is when the value of the molecular weight reduces. Therefore, in order to maintain the requisite molar weight needed for a polymer to be useful for the intended application, the manufacturer of the finished product makes a deliberate effort to reduce the rate at which degradation occurs. This is done by incorporating into the processing mix various other chemicals called additives, such belonging to the group called thermal stabilizers, free radical scavengers, antioxidants, and plasticizers. The nature of the anti-degradants is now dependent on the nature of the weak link in the polymer. Conceptually, therefore, we will only want to stabilize the weak link if we wish to attain a more effective system to arrive at an efficient process of a fit for purpose product. This is the conceptual framework from which the title of this lecture drew its taxonomy. There are two possible approaches we can stabilize. The first approach is to add another polymer molecule as an additive to the polymer of interest. The second approach is to, which is the predominant industrial approach is to add a small organic or inorganic molecule as a plasticizing additive to the polymer of interest. When the polymer is added to another polymer, in the manner explained, what we have is called polymer blend. Polymer blending, or literally polymer mixing, 
is a highly sophisticated technological practice frequently used in the industry as a cost-effective method of attaining high price engineering thermoplastics, for example, as we have in this report, polyphenylene sulfide and, poly, and polystyrene. But there are problems associated with the marriage like this. That is, adding another polymer molecule to another polymer molecule. In addressing the first concern, the first concern, I prepared composite polymer using solution crystallization method over different concentration ranges. That is, we take polystyrene, polyphenylene sulfide, 100 of polystyrene, zero of polyphenylene sulfide, 90 of uh, polyphenylene sulfide, 10 of this, and we did it over a range. In doing this, we discovered that the two polymers are only partially miscible with observed physical and mechanical properties of the mixture lying between that of the PPS and PS. That is, they are not completely miscible over all concentration ranges. Nevertheless, having satisfied that the two polymers are partially miscible, we proceeded to investigate using the molecular steel method, the effect of PS on the degradation of polyphenylene sulfide. There's a small diagram I have here, and you can see there, that is the furnace, that is the pyrolysis tube. The polystyrene is there, the PPS is there. When we heat it, we extend the polystyrene to give out fumes and flow over that of PPS and be able to affect what goes on in PPS. We now changed it, put PS here and PPS there and expected the same to happen. Finally, we now added the two together and degraded them. In both cases, the products of degradation were determined, analyzed and compared with the products of degradation of the respective polymers. Although we did not observe stabilization, that's important, of either polymers, we observed that the products of degradation of the admixed were more either in quantity or in duration than when degraded alone, suggesting an interactive behavior arising from interference from one polymer or the other or in the melt. For the specific case of the PS PPS component, we noted that the onset of degradation occurred at lower temperature compared to when it degraded alone with more detectable products of degradation at the early temperatures. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, permit me to delve into one of the most interesting aspects of my research experience. This second approach is this classical example of stabilizing a polymer using a polymer, a smaller molecule. I will now turn to a polymer called polyvinyl chloride. The degradation of PVC is usually preceded by a dehydrochlorination process which results in the formation of long conjugated double bonds or polyene structures, that is CH double bond, CH double bond, CH double bond, CH double bond, that causes a color change, usually whitening. Further degradation will result in dehydrochlorination, which becomes even more rapid in the presence of oxygen, resulting in formation of carbonyl groups or hydroperoxide. Under relatively low temperature conditions, dehydrochlorination predominates while at high temperatures, both reactions do occur. And I have here a small table that shows you that when we put PVC under three different environments in the oven, under the sunlight, and just place outdoor, the color duration determines the extent of degradation. And these are the reactions that we get when polyvinyl chloride is degraded, unstabilized. I want you to know two things here is the presence of oxygen giving rise to peroxy gel. The second thing I want you to know there is the, the chlorine or the hydrochloric acid, HCl. And these are the main culprits that disturb polyvinyl chloride when they are in use. And so when you get to your home and you see a pipe turning white, it's because it has already started degrading. And the reason is because that whiteness is due to double bond and the HCl that is being given. Therefore, to stabilize PVC, the dechlorination of PVC must be hindered. One of the chemical compounds of choice to use to stabilize PVC under the influence of heat is called dibotene myelate, which, which we call DBTM. And the molar mass is given, and the structure is given as so. DBTM functions by enacting dechlorination and later the subsequent hydroperoxidation in PVC. 
Although DBTM is a thermal stabilizer of choice, it is recognized that the stabilizing action of DBTM is of average success in certain environments, such as sunlight. Average success in certain environments, such as sunlight. And in Nigeria, our climatic condition is a combined effect of heat and sun, UV from the sun. So if you now just use DPTM, this is the result that you get. It is not totally effective. So form the synthesis of esters of trice nitro. Here comes organotin compounds. And these are compounds based on tin with hydrocarbon substituent, which is commercially available as the hydrochloric acid scavenger in polyvinyl chloride. So we use esters to add to PVC and DBTM in order to stabilize PVC. Don't forget of its wild usage. The degradation and stabilization reactions were monitored by infrared color formation, tensile strength, elongation at break, reduced viscosity, as well as determination of time to embrittlement. We recorded reductions in carbonyl formation lack of color formation, and generally improved mechanical properties of the stabilized PVC. Of all the various ratios used, the stabilizing agents of 7.2 times 10 per minus 3 mole percent DBTM in admixture with 10 times 10 per minus 4 mole percent of sterile ester of price nitro was the most effective. The above reported will be the first reported work of using trans nitro ester compounds to stabilize PVC in the whole world. From the three cases discussed here, a theory of stabilization is conceptualized. By determining the weak link in a polymeric structure and substituting the point of failure with another chemical moiety as the new scapegoat, which attribute, amongst others, is that of a lower rate of degradation than the polymer molecule of interest. We saw this in the case of polystyrene. We saw this in the case of polyphenylene sulfide. And we saw it in the case of polyvinyl chloride. We are two different stabilizers stabilizing agents are used because the requirements for antioxidants operating under different conditions differ and are often needed to be accommodated. It is recognized that effective stabilization often requires a combination of antioxidant systems whereby complementary overlap of different mechanistic pathways are involved. After successfully working on those three, I now went into surface coatings. Going by the success of the work on polyvinyl chloride, we proceeded to apply the same principle on surface coatings to otherwise called paints. The combined success of a mixture of organotin compounds deduced from the stabilization attempts of PVC provided further impetus for using them to control the degradation of alkyl resins, surface coatings of paints that are used in our homes. Paint is any liquid liquefiable or mastic composition, which after application to a substrate in the thin layer is converted to an opaque solid network film, otherwise called paints. An alkyl paint is an oil paint made from alcohol and acid, but the word alkyl actually refers to the synthetic resin fatty acid or vegetable oil that is used as a binder in the paint. Alkyl paints are very resistant to normal wear and tear. Thus, this type of print is used commonly for decorative purposes in high traffic type areas, such as doors and trims within the home, and also items that will need painting in the kitchen and bathroom, such as cabinets. Now we know how paints behave when used. First, they are applied as a wet film on the surface. Then through a series of reactions known as cross licking of the bonds in the paint molecule, they dry into a film, and then they assume the color intended. In the case of the alkyl paint, the carbon to carbon double bond in the fatty acid residue of the Fendan group is mainly responsible for the cross linking reactions that culminate in gel work. Thereafter, they start changing color. And before long, cracks are noticed. And by the time cracks become full breakage, the paint color totally changes. The major drawback of the alkyls, therefore, is that they have poor outdoor stability due to the carbon carbon double bond. So we go back to the rescue, an additive that can influence cross licking reactions at any stage will doubtlessly affect the quality and effectiveness of coatings. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. 
It is my honor to report that from my work on coatings, we were able to advance scientific knowledge in these very important areas of research. First, we were able to demonstrate the efficacy of the synergistic combination of stabilizer and antioxidant to the stabilization of a type of alkyl paint in a tropical environment, as has never been reported before. What I, the structure I have there is what we constructed of a gloss, of a gloss meter. Secondly, we were able to design and construct a made in Nigeria gloss meter. Gloss meters are equipment used to determine the degree to which coated surfaces reflect light. We call them gloss. According to the degree of reflection, paints could be called full gloss, semi gloss, eggshell, and platt type of gloss. This equipment was found to be very sensitive to small variations in gloss levels and rigid, portable, and they are very inexpensive compared to the imported ones. Both patents, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, are subject of patenting. I now take my attention to institutional systems. Having explored the polymeric systems, I would like to apply our findings to social systems and more specifically, institutional systems. One of the primary concerns of modern democratic governments in the world is to engage as much as possible a large segment of the populace in active participation in the democratic practices of the country as a route towards social egalitarianism. However, the fact that all human societies exhibit social inequality with attendant stratification in all shades of human endeavor suggests that a communal society like Nigeria must, among many factors, look into what constitutes a path towards stratification, that is, a weak link in achieving its stated objectives. Since no society is happy about social inequality of its constituent parts, most members of a society envision a society in which all members are seen to be equal and are given equal treatment. But as Woods and Burrow explicitly illustrated, the society looking for equal treatment will not insist that identical amount of food should be given to every individual from the newborn baby to the wrestling champion. Rather, that society will strive to apply that same treatment, that same treatment be given to all people except when there are differences to justify the similar treatment. One of the instruments through which many societies in the world strive for social equality, or at least attempt to reduce social inequalities among and between their members is education. This is because education fosters social mobility amongst the participants. This is made possible if there are no barriers preventing certain people from participating in it or if there is no discrimination against people based on social status, among other factors. So we have a system in the country of justice system, healthcare, education, economy, foreign policy, and religion. And it so happens that the description is that it is the chain is breaking in where we have the education uh, icon. And in this case, education is the weak link. How will this scenario affect the other social links? A system of education in which all students are treated equally in the same circumstances is egalitarian. A necessary step towards reducing social inequalities, therefore, is by designing and operating an egalitarian educational system. This, Mr. Vice Chancellor Sir, has found expression through the instrumentality of open and distance learning. Open and distance learning, as observed from, the, from other societies, has largely reduced the inequality in access to education and has therefore accelerated the movement towards egalitarian idealism. Without delving into the philosophical analysis of the concept of egalitarianism, a critical analysis of the concept revealed the role of education and its management in the building of an egalitarian society. In our country, there has been, based on the available statistics, a clear inequity of access to education and the social economic educational divide was becoming apparent. The inequities exist between those who have the means to seek higher education and those who do not. By increasing access to a large segment of society, 
by reaching the most vulnerable in the society, by reaching the disadvantaged people of the society, by providing a level playing field in the provision of access to education and learning, by attempting to reduce the level of illiteracy in the society, the weak link in the society's pursuit of egalitarianism is being ameliorated. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, it is a truism that in our dear country, the open and distant learning mode of instructional delivery has many converts now. Many otherwise single mode face to face universities have now turned dual or are turning dual. This is partly, first, due to the pedigree of the earlier people that championed the course, especially in our country. Partly to the improved delivery channels provided by recent information technology techniques, and partly by the new social reformer in the land, the COVID-19 pandemic. Practitioners in ODL philosophy and operations are now being increasingly created. However, in order for the practice to be comparable in product assessment with its face-to-face counterpart, standards have to be set. Without standards, which can be an obvious weak link, an industry will fail to meet the definition of an industry. One apparent weak link is the non-regulation of either the practitioners or the practice, such that almost anyone with minimal relevant expertise can become, can provide a training program on ODL concept. The question is, does online delivery alone suggest that the contextual philosophy of ODL is met? The status quo is lack of attention to basic educational standards. But will a system with no standards meet the needs of the individual students or that of the society? It is my belief that without standards, educational pursuits will become a, will become a commodity to be purchased rather than an apprenticeship process. Permit me, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, to leave this important discourse to another time and instead focus on weak link in an ODL operating system such as our university. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I wish to state here that since my appointment at the National Open University, I have often subjected the various procedures and processes in the operations of this university to the test of the weakest link. As an industrial process, the management of the open and distant learning system has many components with varying procedures that can lead to the success or failure of the system. In one of my empirical studies carried out in the survey of academics at the university, it was discovered that the perception of management by the academics is a significant point in the realization of the objectives of the academics as a body and or that of the management, whichever way it is perceived. Since at any stage of the university growth, the critical contribution of academics is very significant to the mission of the university. The reference is stated there. In that study, it was discovered that maintaining academic employee perceptions, that management is operating in good faith with his body and having their best interests in mind became increasingly important to form a basis for a psychological contract between the employee and the employer. Given this, we may be able to achieve performance improvements that have somehow always seemed to be well beyond management's grasp. The point is that academics, as is often second guess, may turn out to be the weak link in the performance chain at NOUN, which will not be seen as that of management's own making. Indeed, a one-time experience as shown from the turnover rate of course materials, and hence their availability to students, that the weakest link in the chain of giving students the necessary complement of their course materials is not really money required to publish the materials, though very significant, but the inability of the academics, both internal and external, to develop and write good quality content-based course materials as at when needed. Looking back on this issue, as we all know, the university has now partially stabilized this problem. That, that weakening, that the students are not nearing receiving the full complement of the course materials. What was originally not the weak link, that is the distribution of the course materials, has now become the weak link. I can second guess 
that once this has been solved, it will not be a surprise that the quality content of the course materials will now become the weak link. And it goes on and on and on. The sequence thus becomes perpetually cyclic in order to attain the maximum efficiency of the system. For me, this is the institutional goal. The trites I try to propose, therefore, is that a system that seeks efficiency and effectiveness must continuously seek the weak link in a systemic chain process or procedure and stabilize the weak link and redefine a new weak link within the process until the efficiency and effectiveness of that path to attaining the stated objective is achieved. My mystery experience. It was not until the appointment of Dr. Akiwumi Adishino as Honorable Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development, now President of the African Development Bank, that the world's value chain crept into our lexicon. In brief, an agricultural value chain is a sequence of successful activities required to bring a product or service of a particular crop from time to time. It was planted to the time it was consumed on the table. As were the cases earlier discussed, the purpose of value chain analysis is to increase production efficiency so that a company can deliver maximum value for the least possible cost. This value chain thus, thus renders itself perfectly to the weak link concept as the other systems that I have enunciated above. In the foregoing below is the value chain for white maize consisting of five main interrelating steps. From the input suppliers to farmers to traders, to big traders and distributions to consumers. This is the value chain. For smallholder farmers, like we mainly have in Nigeria, the weak link in the maize value chain is the processing or drying of the maize after they have harvested. At NISPRI, therefore, where I worked for five years, a major effort was to drive the mechanism for drying of maize. This search resulted in the development of a pilot in our gas drying silo whose design is as a result of a three and a half decades of research on controlled atmosphere storage of grains under nitrogen and its recent utilization of technology in Nigeria. The reference is as stated. In conclusion, Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, the detection of weak links is a scientific process that allows for the attainment of stated objectives of any system, whether chemical, physical, polymeric, institutional, and indeed social. In polymeric systems, my research work has reported that successful identification of a weak link and its remediation are possible. In social or institutional systems, this is also certainly possible. Though, because of the human element, stabilizing the weak links takes more considerations. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, I have presented today, what I have presented today is an experiential approach to problem solving based on the detection of a factor critical to the success of planned activity that comprises of related events. It is my belief that if all systems and processes are subjected to this critical analysis, the efficiency of any system will be increased and effectiveness will be enhanced. Richard, it's the strongest link in the last round. You have the choice of who goes first. I'll go first, please. Richard, in music, the Skyboat song relates the story of who's escaped from mainland Scotland with the help of Flora MacDonald. Bonnie Prince Charlie. That is the correct answer. Michael, in printing, the name of which mark used to draw attention footnote comes from the Latin word for a star? Asterisk. That is the correct answer. Richard, in June 2003, researchers for an exhibition of Northwest England's comic heritage appealed for help to find the glasses of which late comedian? Eric Morkham. That is the correct answer. Michael, in politics, the all thing which is the Ooh. oldest democratic parliament in the world is in which country? Iceland. That is the correct answer. Richard, in Buddhism, what five-letter word refers to the actions of individuals and the results of those actions according to the laws of cause and effect? Karma. That is the correct answer. 
Michael, since 1968, the four cities beginning with M that have hosted the Summer Olympics are Mexico City, Munich, Moscow, and which other? Montreal. That is the correct answer. Richard, when assembled in order, the chemical symbols for the elements sulfur, gold, and sodium spell which word for a room often found in a health center? Sauna. That is the correct answer. Michael, which town in northern England was the birthplace of the singers Lisa Stansfield and Gracie Fields and of the actress Anna Friel? Rochdale. That is the correct answer. No, I asked for first name. The second one that we're trying to do now. That is Richard Thomas Nixon. You go away with 3,400. That is the correct answer. Now, so after five questions each, your score is that I want you to recall that when we started, there were nine contestants. And all what they were doing was eliminating the weak link. And elimination of the weak link is just, they just ask you, who is the weak link? And once you vote, and the name of the person becomes small, then you are eliminated. And you could see until they got to two, only two of them. Now, at the last when it is two, it is no longer whimsical. It is now scientific. A question is asked. And if you don't know the answer, then you are eliminated. And that was what happened in this particular case. Acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, not yet riches to the men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance upon it to them all. My eternal gratefulness goes to the Almighty for his gracious mercy. If I have sinned further, it is by standing on the shoulder of giants. And I wish to acknowledge the following people, the late Professor Bob Bewele, who was my MSc project supervisor, Dr. Dick Steele, who was my PhD supervisor, Professor Inyo, who was a friend at ABU Zaria, Professor Muiwa Turoti, who was a student at ABU Zaria, Mr. Ben Dashi was a friend at Zaria. Dr. Adini Late, who was my benefactor. Professor Olayemi, Professor Polaole, Professor Ayoko, Professor Thomas, Professor Bonire, recently late, Colonel Fayos Uhunyo, who, who was also a research student with me, and Professor Domingo Okore, who was my undergraduate research project supervisor. In March, stroke April 1982, I haven't just completed my master's degree at ABU Zaria. My girlfriend asked me my plan for the future. Since I was a drifter with no specific plan, I simply muttered something. Essentially, I said, I could go back to Lagos to seek for employment in a chemical-based company. But when I looked at her face and I noticed that she frowned at that response, I quickly added that I could well go for my PhD and be a lecturer. To this, I noticed slight approval. You see, at that time in Zaria, lecturing was the main industry worth pursuing. Yes, why not for Emily Yela, later Mrs. Emily Peters, of loving and blessed memory, my wife and big mommy, I probably would have just drifted until a career found me. She stood forthrightly by me ever since that statement was muttered. Therefore, I wish to thank her posthumously for the support, care, and poise she brought to the union. In the context of this speech, I can equivocally say that I was weakling in the union, and that I had to go through various stabilization regimes. I wish to thank my children, Ms. D, Mr. D, Damero, Mr. Kenny Charles, and expectantly, Ms. Tola Adeoye, for doing us proud in their various occupational engagements. Muyo Sore Oluwa, can I ever forget Ms. Mo, a split image of all attributes of her grandmother, a great gift from God Almighty. I wish to remember my late father and father-in-law, both of whose confidence in my ability I found difficult to justify, but nevertheless provided me with confidence booster and from which their spouses continued in like manner. My family could claim, though, that were it not for the weaklings of the Nigerian system, I might still have ended up as an inventor 
or a manufacturer. Industrial manufacturing was my early love, spurred on by doctors Philip Obande and Bob DeWille, respectively, a willing accomplice in Bayo Yewale, now professor, and nurtured by the Raw Materials Research and Development Council and the Standards Organization of Nigeria, I still have in my possession some unpatented processes and various results from researches intended to produce manufacturable items. This is where my stint at Newsplay e learning became relevant to the completeness of my life career. There, through the handwork of some staff, such as Dr. Patricia Pesu, Dr. Laiemi, Dr. Biodun, Dr. Akonde, Dr. Babarinsa, Dr. Grace Otutoju, Dr. Sam Uwabani, Dr. Modara, Dr. Iwale, and Ms. Ego Oponko, I finally led the team that got potential viable products patented. I do claim certain privileges though. Aside from the people I mentioned above, I also need to mention such bodies like the Federal Government of Nigeria, who gave me a scholarship at Masters and UK, the Association of Commonwealth of, Univers of Universities, the Chemical Society of Nigeria, the Raw Materials Research and Development Council, the Standards Organization of Nigeria, the Commonwealth of Land in Canada, and Baja Paints Lagos and Babeku PLC in Kaduna. I also want to mention Professor Eminefo Akirejola, who appointed me general coordinator at the SGRS, School of General and Remedial Studies in Libya, Uzaria, which provided me the enabling environment and resource to be successful at ABU Uzaria during those tough days. Apart from these aforementioned people, I am blessed with friends such as Lanria Adishwi, Benson and Alaket Tugubo, Sukomi Adebayo, Big Boss, Honorable Lanri Laoshe, Professor Femi Ogunide, Professor Femi Odekunle, recently late, Rukayat Odekunle, Ashiwaju and Yeye Daisi Aino, Professor Isa Funtua, Malam Nurak Baka, Professor Sonny Oniye, Reverend Pastor Sam Munitiri, Professor Timia Korono, and Dr. Kansi Salako, who, though far away in America, was a pervasive reminder of the need to make success of my chosen career. Finally, I need to mention and thank Professor Lubu Mbujagede. Moving to ODL was certainly neither in my sight nor in my dream, even though as a student at the Federal School of Science, Lagos, in 1974-75, I enrolled two of my A-level courses with the Rapid Resource College, London, as additional learning support to my classes. Little did I know that I would work in the local university. But I had the privilege of an uncharted encounter with Professor Jagede in 2002 at a workshop where I got hooked to the philosophy and practice of ODL. I certainly can say that I've benefited most from incisive discussions that underlie the processes and procedures that provide both logistical and theoretical basis for ODL practice. In the same vein, I'm also much gladdened to add Professor Aminu Dorai, any of you who know him, Mr. Gideon Seja, and Professor Christine Ofulwe, the latter unwittingly providing me my ODL laboratory environment during the early days of the university, and with whom I still enjoy great ODL discussions. When the idea of an inaugural lecture was first muted at the university, it was naturally expected that I would be the first to make presentation. I was indeed poised. However, God's time, people say, is the best. So I thank the National Open University of Nigeria for this opportunity to finally have it here today. I am thus grateful to my immediate past dean, Professor Munyolu Aulani, and other deans of the Faculty of Science and Technology, the late Professor A. Adibanjo, Professor Mba Okoronko, OON, Professor T.K. Obidairo, and the then staff of the School of Science and Technology, now faculty, Mono, Padimatu, Vicky, Amos, Chioma, and Franka, who in many ways assisted my stay in the faculty. May I thank the members of the Polymer Institute of Nigeria and all my ex-students and the staff I worked with at all my administrative offices, both at ABU, NISPRI, and at NOW, for their respective contributions to my career. The last word. I wish to thank Professor Abdallah Uba Adamu, our Vice Chancellor. In 2002, the path of Professor Abdallah and my crossed unwittingly at Lokoja many years ago at the Post Material Development Workshop, meant to precede the resuscitation of this university. Here we are, such so that it pleased God to appoint him the fourth vice chancellor of our great university. And it was him who graciously approved my presentation of this lecture after about 15 years when it should have been presented. I wish to note that Professor Abdallah is a profoundly decent and God fearing man. May he be blessed in his future endeavors. 
Mr. Vice Chancellor Sir, the principal officers of the university, members of Senate, dean faculty of science, deans of other faculties, directors of, of academic centers, study center directors, other directors in the university, my children and extended family, my old boys, 6072 schoolmates and friends, distinguished colleagues, distinguished guests, members of my professional societies, members of Fountain of Hope, 10 NG, ladies and gentlemen, and all who have listened patiently, patiently to this presentation via the Zoom link, I thank you all. I think he deserves more than that. Let's give it another thunderous round of applause. Well, it is not within my purview to declare whether or not that uh, presentation was excellent or not. It is the vice chancellor's gig. So in a moment, he will be uh, right here to deliver just that. But at this very moment, may I invite uh, the vice chancellor for the official transmission of that inaugural lecture to the vice chancellor. Right. My Vice Chancellor, sir, in a very brief moment, uh, you, I'll be calling upon you for your remarks. But just before then, Vice Chancellor, sir, permit me very expressly to recognize all the people who are joining us for this all important inaugural lecture. It's my pleasure to bring before our notice uh, that the Deputy Executive Secretary of the NUC, Dr. Ramon Yusuf, is also online. Professor Godwin Akbe is also online. Professor Grace Jokton, uh, Dr. A. A. Njida, uh, Mrs. Caroline Obasoro, Assist Associate Professor Alhassan Mukhtari, the Director MIS, Professor Sam Sma, uh, Director Sirewis, Dr. Felix Benoba, uh, Professor Charito Okonku, Mrs. Margaret Merari, uh, are also online. Uh, Professor McCarthy, Moje is also online, uh, Professor Sami Ayodele, Professor Rotimi Ogidon, Professor Juliet uh, Enigbidon, Professor Christine Ofulwe, Professor Chedu Mafiana, Professor Doris Ubeje, uh, Mr. Ukoha Igwe, the former university librarian, Professor Monulua Olaniyi is also online. Uh, it's my pleasure also to bring before our notice Professor, that Professor Shelley Yulifodi is also online. Professor Beatrice Ijofo, Professor A. O. Oyewale, uh, Dr. Tosin uh, Awulalu. Uh, we also have Associate Professor Ganiad Adeshina Othman, Dr. Jo uh, Joseph at Izonobi, uh, Professor Wesley Okei, uh, Professor Isaac Boswat, Mrs. Leka, uh, the Director of the Special Studies Center for the Nigerian Police, Dede, is also online. Uh, from the Faculty of Sciences, those who made sure uh, that uh, Professor Femi Peters is not here alone, of course, that's the entourage to this very all important gathering from that faculty. We have Dr. Uh, Emeka Ojebo, uh, we have uh, Dr. Juliana Odunagu, uh, Dr. Rondi Musa, we have Dr. Rele of Fola Runsho, Dr. Harriata Kelly, uh, Dr. Vivian Wacha, uh, Mr. Yusuf Alhaji, and of course, the HOD of the inaugural lecturer, uh, the Department of Pure and Applied Sciences, uh, Dr. Maureen Chuku. Others also are online. The moment we harvest those names, we shall be bringing before our notice. But before then, at this very moment, let me invite uh, the head of the geek, of course, the Vice Chancellor of the National Open University of Nigeria, who has been waiting patiently with his surgical blade to say whether or not the lecture was splendid. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Well, uh, my job is to summarize this extremely complex compound lecture. It's a compound inaugural lecture. 
This is not one lecture. There are three lectures combined together, connected by a conceptual thread. The first lecture was on chemistry of polymers. And the most important thing about that particular lecture is the connection between what we see in the laboratory and real lives. This is the first time I've seen such connection. You look at all those formulas and things like that, but now it has been deconstructed. The ordinary bottle, the, the pure water, uh, plastic, all these things have now been deconstructed as part of what we see as a scientific process and enterprise. Professor Sir, congratulations for the first inaugural. The second inaugural lecture, it deals with political philosophy, the way in which egalitarianism has now been brought in about democracy, uh, weak links, and the way in which we can create an equitable society. That's uh, another inaugural lecture in philosophy. So if anybody in the Department of Philosophy feels that they can do an inaugural lecture, it has already been done by our Vice Chancellor. And then the third lecture is on ODL, which is the main, the main forte, the main dish, as it were, of where we are. So to me, as listen to this, we have three combined inaugural lectures. But the most critical thing is moving from what I have always insisted as a philosophy is from moving from debate to action. It is not enough to just simply talk about conceptual frameworks, theoretical frameworks and things like that. But we need to see the way in which the results of scientific enterprise can be translated as part of everyday reality. So now when you pick up your swan bottle, the plastic bottle of water, see it in the light of what you have learned about degradation. And that is why they keep telling you, don't use that bottle again and again and again, because it is degrading the more you use it. And the, the beauty of the lecture is that it also plays into reality of everyday activities. This paint that we see is part of this lecture. This paint on this lectern is also part of that lecture. So everything that we do in our lives is connected to this particular concept of polymer chemistry. And we would like to thank Professor Peters for bringing to our attention laymen presenting an extremely highly intellectual lecture, but in a simple way that we, the laymen, can understand. It's now my pleasure to briefly summarize what the lecture was about, because we have another meeting at 12 o'clock, uh, which is the council meeting. Professor Peters has presented to us the distinct inaugural lecture of the National Offing University of Nigeria called Weak Links, a Structural Phenomenon to Systematic and Institutional Efficiency, a topic inspired by the television quiz show called The Weakest Link which you used to run from one of the multi-choice DSTV channels at 5 p.m. in 2001, showing that Professor Peters has always been privileged. In 2001, not, not many of us can afford DSTV. Not many of us even know DSTV is. We only are contented with the NTA and Kokoro at Dawn and all the other programs. <laughs> he told us himself that his late wife were ardent viewers, just as he informed us that a number of his research experiences also led him to the same title. It's very, very important that your everyday experience have always been at the forefront of your life and eventually they integrate themselves into your intellectualism. I always like doing that. Picking up things from maybe pop songs, uh, Pelas songs, and then translating that into an academic activity. He reminded us thus, the definition of weak link is the weakest part of a system or the weakest member of a group, people that could cause the whole system or a group to fail and achieve a stated objective. In his application of this concept, particularly to National Open University of Nigeria, we now know that our cost materials delivery system is our weakest link. And therefore, we need to do something more about that. And which we are doing. As a result of the BLE the training that we have had now, we are now going to convert all our study materials into virtual learning environment to meet the contemporary needs of our students. So that means that Professor Peters has identified our weak link and now we're heading towards solving that weak link. How are we held in towards solving that weak link? Because he's the next vice chancellor. So he's going to supervise the process of getting rid of that weak link. But he did say that when one weak link is solved, then you pick up another one. But that shows the dynamism of human existence. No human society is, is perfect. 
all human beings are perfect. So the more you identify your, your weak links and get rid of them, the more you are now open uh, other link, weak links. This lecture discusses the concept of, the, of weak link as a factor that determine the performance level of a stated goal, not just in chemical system, but also in all systematic activities that occur in our daily lives and places of work that he encountered in his professional life. He told us about his wonderful experience in Ahmadu Bella University, and he actually mentioned some of the people that I, were my friends, like Sony uh, Oni, uh, Joshua Oni, with whom we did secondary school and then university together. Um, <clears throat> I was in education and he was in the Faculty of Science. He looked at polymers, which we know as plastics, and through a series of experiments on three different types of polymers, polystyrene, polypylene, sulfide, and polyvinyl chloride. He was able to scientifically show that the failure under any application of huge stress can be traced to the presence of weak links, which in chemistry he attributed to the different trends of the chemicals bond that hold the respective polymers together. PVCs are very important. So that means why does your house leak? Your house leak because the, 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 the polymer that has, has de degraded. And that is why you have beautiful house, but then you start seeing leaks uh, on, on your paint. Now you have known that that was the degradation. It's not that the, the, the plumber was, was bad. It's just simply that the, the, the PVC that they use is bad. So we have now seen a dynamic application in reality of a scientific concept. This is the first time in my experience that this link is clearly made. Once more, sir, congratulations for that. It was brilliant. From the three cases he discussed, he propounded the theory of stabilization, which was by determining the weak link in any polymeric structure and substituting the point of failure with another chemical moiety, <coughs> the new scapegoat, uh, which, attributes, uh, which whose attribute among others is that of lower rate of degradation than the polymeric molecule of interest, one is able to ameliorate the weak link. One is able to ameliorate the link. Very, very important. Once we understand that our course materials are weak link, we now move to virtual learning environment in order to solve that weak link. I don't know what will happen after five years whether we can see another weak link popping up. Because while you are busy trying to block one weak link, you are exposing your plank to, to other weak links. Having explored the polymeric system, he used it as a basis for next intervention in social system, especially as it relates to ODL. Uh, and like I said, not only did he do it in ODL, but also in social philosophy. I would have loved a much more expansion on the social philosophy part because we have professors of philosophy here and we would like to, to see. But the beauty of our, our inaugural lecture is that nobody is allowed to ask questions. And therefore, you are free to say whatever you like to say. People can agree with you or disagree with you, but they do it offline. If we had a, a debate, we will have seen how this particular concept now can be applied to social philosophy, to educational philosophy, as well as to scientific uh, reasoning. Professor Peters further demonstrated his graph of the lecture when he linked his concept of weak links and subsequent uh, substabilization of it with his experience at Nigeria Stored Produce Institute. At Nespri, as I heard him pronounce it, I've never <laughs> known this, but at Nespri, he reported his happiness in leading research institute into solving one of the weak links in the value chain of the grains in general, uh, in general and maize in particular. In his conclusion, Professor Peters reminded us that unlike in the game show, as earlier shown, the detection of weak links is a scientific process that allows for the attainment of stated objectives of any system, whether chemical, physical, polymeric, institutional, and indeed social. He therefore advanced that all systems and processes be subjected to this critical analysis. The efficiency of any such system will increase, the effectiveness uh, will be increased, and the effectiveness will be enhanced. Distinguished audience. We could not have listened to a well-rendered lecture than this, which points to the scholarship of one of our own, who proudly and incidentally, it has pleased God to be appointed our incoming vice chancellor on the 11th of February, 2021. Two weeks from now. My congratulations, sir. And uh, may God continue to guide you and to protect you. And may God give you power and grace to hold the university in a stronger, greater, stronger, stronger uh, future. And may God help you to identify the weak links in the university. So thank you very much, my vice chancellor. And thank you indeed for the <laughs> Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, my Vice Chancellor. And indeed, thank you for deconstructing that uh, highly technically laced uh, lecture uh, into uh, the understanding of more people who are joining us live and online. Well, what you just did, my Vice Chancellor, permit me to expressly put it this way, uh, reminds me of some electronics that comes into this country, particularly from America. They come with the voltage of 110. Uh, but meanwhile, the, the, the voltage permission within our uh, electric uh, circulation is supposed to be 220 or get about. Yeah. So what the, uh, the inaugural lecturer did was to, uh, was to bring in his electronics in like 110 volts, and you further stepped it down to 220 so that it could be well assimilated. So thank you very much for that. Let me also very quickly recognize the presence of um, my director, uh, director of media and communications, uh, media and publicity, I beg your pardon, in terms of, uh, in person of Malem Ibrahim Sheme, who is here with us uh, since the commencement of this business. Before we close, let me invite um, for a vote of thanks, the chairman inaugural lecturer, planning committee, uh, the inaugural lecture planning committee in person of Professor Samayla Mande, uh, to deliver his vote of thanks. Thank you, MC. Um, we thank God for everything, for this special moment, and now for this very item, which is uh, for me to give uh, a vote of thanks. Let me first of all specifically thank the university management under this critical moment nationally for giving us the opportunity to organize this event. <clears throat> it is not easy because we can see clearly the way things are nationally in various dimensions. But for the management of the university to deem it necessary and worthy enough that this inaugural lecture will come and indeed be passed today specially. And so I want to thank the university management, deeply led by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Abdullah Uba Adamu, and then of course the bossa of the university, despite the tight situation in the system. Immediately the document came to say, okay, we should proceed. I want to thank you, Bossa, for this wonderful support and all that. Of course, the registrar. Thank you very much. I also want to specifically thank the lecturer because honestly speaking, we are talking about weaklings and all that. So we are hearing some terms today. So I want to thank you for this outstanding lecture. And according to what the, uh, the vice chancellor said, it is something that will all continue to be with it. Thank you very much. And I want to also equally thank the Senate of this university. And then I understand that uh, virtually a member of council of the university, Dr. Ramon Yusuf, was also uh, joined the lecture. We want to thank uh, the members that also joined online virtually. And of course, the entire members of now staff, because we can see the way and manner they responded. And then the members of the planning committee, I want to thank you immensely for this task. One unique unit, a strategic unit, a great unit in the university that was able to put this thing for us to now have it virtually is the DLCMS. I want to thank the DLCMS directorate. As a, far, as a matter of fact, ably led by uh, Dr. Uh, Adeshino, whom I refer to as a uh, the brigade of the moment in National Open University of Nigeria. So we want to thank the DLCMS and of course, the director of the media, uh, Malem Ibrahim Sheme. We want to thank you for everything. And on this note, may God bless us for all we have done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean of Deans. Now we've come to the end of proceedings here. Before we eventually depart from this venue and close down our virtual platform, may I equally advise that we rise uh, for the NOUN anthem to be followed by the national anthem.
Professor Olufemi Peters. At this very moment, uh, may I ask that the rece academic recession uh, takes its leave uh, with the Vice Chancellor leading the team.